Praise the name of the Lord. If you have your Bibles today, <clears throat> if you have your Bibles today and you'd open them with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, I have one single verse that I'm going to use as my jumping off point today for my message. One single verse that we're all familiar with. We've heard it. We've read it. We've heard it preached probably hundreds of times if you've been in the church for any length of time at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads as follows. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, let's read it again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, It is what it is. Amen. It is what it is. Master, we love you. We thank you for the wonderful, uplifting, encouraging, inspiring presence of God that we feel in the house of the Lord. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Sometimes our circumstances weigh us down so heavily that when the inhabitants of Babylon come and ask us to sing the songs they have heard us sing so many times before, joyfully, with rejoicing, it's difficult. But Master, somehow, some way. As we begin to sing the great old hymns of the church, as we begin to sing praise and adoration and worship, we find strength, we find energy, we find the ability to worship you because in spite of our circumstance, in spite of our situation, you are still worthy to be praised and our spirit knows this master now must the word of God go forth now oh God is the hour when the word of God must be preached with power with anointing with the presence of God behind it that the hearer might understand they're not hearing man made opinion or man man-made conjecture or doctrine but they're hearing the truth of God which is able to set them free anoint today O God this feeble weak messenger help me to deliver unto the people of God the message that you have placed in my spirit for this moment in time anoint every ear to hear every heart to receive for we ask it in none other than Jesus wonderful wonderful name amen praise God and amen I have to tell you today we have some extended members people we love people we know who have been with us for many years Every Sunday they're with us live if they're able. If not, they watch every service as soon as they're able. And they're supportive of this church. They love this pastor. They pray for us. 
And we've got some extended members today who are going through great difficulties. Going through tough times. And I want to tell you as a pastor, I went before the Lord this week and I said, Lord, you've already laid a message on my heart, but I really wish you could give me a word that would be expressly comforting and encouraging and inspiring for these who are going through such trouble. Folks, there are times when I wish I could pick my subject matter. There are times when I wish I could choose what to preach on or what kind of a message to deliver. But that is not my calling. That is not how this preacher operates. I preach what God gives me when He gives it to me. And although I ask the Lord to give me something different, something more encouraging, more inspiring, He just constantly kept bringing me back, bringing me back, bringing me back to this message. So this message must be for somebody who's watching today. It must be for somebody who is going to hear this word at this hour. There exists perhaps today no greater misunderstood or misrepresented passage in all of the word of God than the passage which I have read today. Many point to this passage almost accusingly when trying to refute the new birth experience of another person whose life or manner of life is different than that with which they approve or with which they agree. But many who use this passage as a weapon are themselves condemned by this very passage. Unlike what we hear taught in so many churches today, the Apostle Paul was not telling us how a believer ought to act or behave but rather he was making a declaratory statement. He was making a clear declaration. Anyone who has genuinely become a part of Christ through the new birth experience is a new creature. He was not saying, if you wish to be a Christian, listen to me. You must act like a different person than you were before you were converted. It's not what he was saying. He was declaring plainly that new life in Christ, the new birth experience, brings a newness to our very existence. It's not an issue of what we can be or what we should be, but rather a declaration of what is if we are in fact in Christ. I've titled my message today, It Is What It Is. There are some circumstances, there are some situations that we find ourselves in and somebody might say, you know, I don't know how in the world you can deal with that. I don't know how you can handle that situation. And oftentimes we respond, well, it is what it is. It simply is and I tell the truth. Amen. There's not much I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about changing it. It is what it is. I have to contend with what is. In our primary text today, 
the Apostle Paul makes a clear declaration. If, if, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not he can be. Not he should be. Not he should act like a. No, Paul said he is. If this, then this will be what it is. Hallelujah. If you're in Christ, you will be a new creature. Too many in the fundamentalist and evangelical church world today do not understand the truth of what Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and too many of them as I've said are condemned by this very passage because while they claim to be a born again child of God, they are still as hateful as they were before they were converted. They're still as homophobic as they were before they were converted. They're still as judgmental. They're still as condemnatory. They're still as critical as they were before they were converted. But if a man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And the fact that you are not new, the fact that you are not changed, the fact that you do not now feel motivated to walk and talk and live like Jesus is evidence that you are not in Christ. Hmm. There are many people today who are in the church, but they are not in Christ. Oh, I'll tell you, I've been to many a church in my day. I've met a lot of believers. Oh, I've met a lot of people who claim to be born again children of God. Oh, but I want to tell you, it's not hard to see when you're talking to somebody who is what it is. They are a new creature. Hallelujah. Their way of thinking is different. Their way of looking at things is different. Their way of understanding things is different. They exercise much more compassion. They exercise a much greater capacity for love. They, they tend to shy away from being judgmental and critical and condemnatory because Jesus said judge not lest you be judged and then there are those who are in the church but clearly they're not in Christ the thing that troubles me about so many LGBT believers especially, but not exclusively, many people who are not LGBT have been turned off to the church and turned off to God and turned off to Christianity by the actions or the words of someone in the church who was not in Christ. I've learned to just turn off the jackals that aren't in Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've, I've learned to distinguish between somebody who's in the church and somebody who's in Christ. And I don't even listen to those knuckleheads 
who are in the church but they're not in Christ. Hallelujah. If they don't have a Christ-like way of looking at things, if they don't have a Christ-like way of exercising compassion and mercy and charity and love, then you know what, Tommy? Let them talk all they want to. They ain't going to talk to me. I'll turn around and walk right away from them while they're standing there talking. I have an aunt. I should say I have an aunt. Ever since the day I came out, she's done nothing but criticize and judge and condemn. Oh my heavens, she has been full of all kinds of negativity and all kinds of judgment. Why, she's so holy that when I would go to my grandparents' house to visit my grandparents' Uh, if I were sitting in the living room talking to my grandmother, this aunt would not go in the living room. She was too holy to be in the same room with me. Why? Because I tried to convince her to deny her faith in Christ because I come against her walk with God because I make fun of her faith or I criticize her Christianity. No! None of those things are true. None of those things will ever be true. But just because she doesn't understand my life the way I do, she doesn't understand my walk with God the way I do. She doesn't agree with my life and my Christian experience. And therefore, she feels justified in sinning in judgment of me, not even able to be in the same room with me. Oh, but... While I lived in New York City, I used to invite uh, or welcome many family members who would ask me, Chuck, can I come? Can I bring my family? Can I bring my kids to New York? Would you mind if, if, we, if we came to New York, would you mind showing us around? Because we've always been afraid of this city, you know. We've always been a little nervous. Uh, most of my family kind of come from the country a little bit in Connecticut, so New York is, is scary to them, you know. But having a family member who lived there for a long time, they felt like, you know, I could show them around and they'd feel comfortable because somebody they knew who knew the city was showing them around. And I never one time, never refused anybody Whoever asked me if I would do this, including this aunt, who had nothing good to say to me, who constantly came against me, who constantly voiced her condemnation and her hateful, spiteful, nasty, critical foolishness. When she asked me if she could bring her four kids and some of their friends to New York and if I'd mind showing them around like I had so many other family members. I'm a Christian. I'm a born again believer. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I look at things differently. I approach things differently. I didn't look at her with hatefulness. I didn't look at her with anger. I didn't look at her with vengeance and say, no, you've never treated me right, so why should I bother? I got news for you. That thought never even went through my mind. She asked me if she could come and bring her kids. And I immediately said, yes, Faith, of course. Sure you can. I'd love to have y'all. If any man be in Christ, he is 
a new creature. Not he can be. Not he should be. Not he has to try to be. But he is. Oh, I'm going to tell you, a born again believer finds themselves saying the right thing sometimes. And only after a while we stop and think about it and say, you know, I could have said this or I could have reacted that way or I could have reacted this way. But automatically we found ourselves responding and reacting in a righteous manner. What is right? Uh, what is righteous? Righteous simply means right. Mm -hmm. We reacted the way we ought to according to the teaching of God's Word. I didn't have to put any thought into answering her. It didn't take me two seconds. I didn't have to stop and give it some thought before I answered her. No. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And as a child of God, as a born again believer, all I know to operate in is love. Amen. Amen. I don't know how to operate from a place of hate. I don't know how to operate from a place of vengeance. I don't know how to operate from a place of maliciousness or malice. I don't know how to do that. It's not in me to act that way. She came with her kids and I took them all over the city. Unfortunately, the day they came, it rained and rained and we had a heavy fog that day. So there were some things I normally would do with visitors I wasn't able to do with them. And I felt real bad because I would love to have taken them up into the World Trade Center, but we couldn't do it that day because if we'd have gone up, all you'd have seen was fog and clouds. You wouldn't have been able to see anything else. A little while later, she asked me, if she could come once again to the city and visit, but this time without the kids, and I agreed, and she came, and she came into my home, and while she was in my home, she decided she was going to start preaching me into hell for being who I was. And oh, guess what passage of Scripture she was going to use as her preaching text. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know what I did? I wasn't mean. I wasn't malicious. I wasn't angry. But I was in my home, and you got a right to put up with or not put up with anything you want to put up with or not put up with in your own home. That's right. And I told her, I said, Faith, honey, when I'm in Connecticut and I'm in your house, you can preach any crap only you want to preach at me. But honey, you're in my house. And you are not going to disrespect me and you are not going to chide me and you are not going to rebuke me and carry on like some kind of a nutcase in my house. So you stay right here a minute because I'm going to go make a phone call. And I went to the phone and I called up a car service. And I walked her down the stairs of my apartment to the front of the front door. And I handed the driver a certain amount of money because in New York when you call the car service, they tell you how much the triple beat before they pick you up, you know. It's almost like uh, Ute, uh, Uber and stuff, you know. And so I handed the man the money and I said, take this lady to Grand Central Station. She's going to be taking a train back home to Connecticut. Nothing hateful about what I did. I wasn't malicious. I wasn't mean. I didn't leave her in the lurch. 
I didn't get her stuck somewhere. No. I put her in the car and sent her on her way. Because in my home, I'm not going to put up with that foolishness. There's a lot of people out there. You deal with these people and oftentimes not only will you deal with somebody who's in the church but not in Christ. Not only will you put up with their foolishness when you're on their turf but you'll put up with their foolishness when you're on your turf. And that's where you are in the wrong. You are under no obligation to stand there and listen to their foolishness when they're on your soil, when they're in your home, when they're on your territory. No, no, no. But just as you, as they expect you to respect them when you're at their house, I expect them to respect me when they're in my house. Hello now. Well, tell you, if more... Christians who struggle because of ungodly conduct on the part of people who call themselves believers. If more people who struggle because of these folks who are in church but not in Christ, if more of them would learn to set boundaries because those people without fail do not know what boundaries are. Mm -hmm. They have no problem sticking their nose into your business. They have no problem sticking their nose into your bedroom. They have no problem sticking their nose into your sexual orientation or into your relationships. But their nose does not belong there. So stand up for yourself. And if you're in their home, they're talking foolishness, and it's hurtful, it's painful. Honey, you got two little things underneath your waistline called legs. Get up on them and walk out. Not too long after I came out in 1989, my grandmother had her talk with me one day. She said, honey, we love you and you're always welcome in our home and everything. But some of these friends you've got and some of these people that you've been hanging out with, she said, I'd really prefer you not bring them here with you. I said, okay, Grandma, no problem. When I was a kid, I had uncles who were whoremongers. I'm going to say it plainly. They slept with every girl that they could put a hand on. And they dragged those girls through that house. I had uncles, man, had more girlfriends than I had socks. Every time I'd go to my grandparents' house, there'd be another one of these girls there with one of my uncles. And I told my grandmother, I said, you know, what I find funny, I said, some of these boys of yours had all kinds of loose women, all kinds of girls up in here that you know good and well they weren't acting right with. But I never one time heard you tell one of my uncles not to bring his little, quote, floozies home with him. I said, so Grandma, I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to save you a lot of trouble. I said, my friends are as important to me as their little girlfriends were to them if not more. I said, and if my friends aren't welcome, then I won't bother coming back either. And I started walking to the door. My grandmother stopped me. She said, CJ, stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. She said, I'll tell you what. She said, how about if we just act like we never had this little discussion? Sometimes, folks, you got to stand up for yourself. Sometimes you got to quit being a pushover and a coward. You don't have to be hateful. You know, I didn't say anything hateful to her. 
but I pointed out the hypocrisy. And she responded in a positive manner. If any man be in Christ, he is. Not he can be, not he should be, not he ought to act like, but he is a new creature. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, the word of the Lord said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth not walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Now listen. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness wherefore putting away lying speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication Proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's what walking in the new man. Paul said, put on the new man. That's what the new man looks like right there. The new man gets angry but doesn't act the fool and doesn't beat on somebody, doesn't take vengeance on somebody, doesn't look for revenge, doesn't behave in an ungodly manner simply because they've become angry. No, they can become angry and sin not. They can speak only things which minister grace to the hearer. Got news for you, honey. Condemnation and criticism and judgment do not minister grace to anybody anywhere at any time. The primary thing that changes when we genuinely become a born-again believer, listen to me, is the internal mindset. Things we once might have rebuffed or rejected 
we now have become open to and are willing to embrace. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean things like love, forgiveness, mercy, gentleness, compassion, charity. Any of these godly attributes become things which we now lean toward and prefer over anger, malice, revenge, vengeance. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. The new birth experience is a spiritual experience and therefore it is not an external experience but an internal work. In John chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The born again experience is a spiritual new birth. As a spiritual new birth it occurs inwardly. Am I telling the truth now? Amen. Oh something changes if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. Does his external man change? No. The word of God said, Behold, all things are become new. Your eye color doesn't change. Your hair color doesn't change. Your height, your stature, your weight doesn't change. Your suit's shoe size doesn't change. But it says all things are become new. Yes. Inwardly. There's a change on the inside. I had an uncle many years ago when I would go to my aunt and uncle's house. I often heard him yelling and screaming at my aunt. And there were times when I heard him hitting on her. Scared us kids. We'd be up in my cousin's bedroom and We'd be scared hearing all this going on downstairs. Didn't know what to do. One day this uncle came to church with my aunt. When it come time for the altar call, he went to that altar. He turned his life over to the Lord. He received the gift of the Holy Ghost. He never laid a hand on my hand again. Hallelujah. He never touched her again. Why? Because something on the inside changed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The anger and the malice and whatever it was within him that caused him to behave this way was now changed. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, I've seen people born again. 
I've seen people come to the Lord and I've seen God deliver from drug addiction. I've seen God deliver from sexual addiction. I've seen God deliver from alcohol addiction. I've seen Him do incredible things at the moment of one's conversion. And that is not to say that you cannot be a child of God and still struggle with some things. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when we become a child of God, suddenly everything around us looks different. Why? Because everything around us has changed? No, because everything in us has changed. Therefore, we see everything differently. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man, with his deeds. How many of those things I've just read to you are external? Anger, wrath, malice, but none of them. They're all internal, aren't they? They're all things that are part of who we are as a person. Paul said, put those things off. Why? He said, because you've put off the old man. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Let lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. If any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Well, I'll tell you, you come to the Lord and all of a sudden, whereas in the past your first thought might be violence, your first thought might be malice, your first thought might be anger, and yet as a child of God, all of a sudden you just find yourself, you're not making yourself do this, you're finding yourself responding differently 
reacting differently, doing things differently. I love when people try to tell me that an LGBT person can't be a child of God, can't be a born-again Christian, because after all, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Oh, honey. <laughs> I'm glad God has better eyesight than you do. I'm glad that my God can see things you can't see. Because while you like to try to sit in judgment of folks like me, based upon what you can see with your little old weak human eye, God's looking at me and saying, Boy, <laughs> have you changed? Oh, he got a person on the book. Woo, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how I used to do things. Oh, but glory to God, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I've got news for you, sweetheart. You may not see it, but what used to be a dragon in here is now a unicorn. Hallelujah to God. What used to be a demon is now an angel. Hallelujah. You don't know because you judge by outward appearance. But God looks upon the heart. And if you think that I'm the same person I was before I came to the Lord, <laughs> it's only because you didn't know me before I came to the Lord. My word, you hear what I'm telling you now. Almost done today. Galatians 5, 14 through 23. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. For the, fl the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen carefully. But the fruit of the Spirit is let me repeat that in case you missed it but the fruit of the spirit is love is joy is peace is long suffering is gentleness, is goodness, is faith, is meekness, is temperance. Against such there is no law. 
it is what it is. The fruit of the Spirit, the manifestation of the presence of God's Spirit in our lives is, again, not should be, not can be, not could be, not you should work so that it is. No, no, no. The manifestation of the presence of the Spirit of God in our lives is love. So if love is there, then honey, you're bearing fruit. If joy is there, then you're bearing fruit. If peace is there, long-suffering is there, gentleness is there, goodness is there, faith is there, meekness is there, temperance is there, then the fruit is manifesting itself. If it is, if it is, if it is present, if it is visible, I got news for you, honey. I know any number of LGBT believers who demonstrate and manifest more of the fruit of the Spirit. And I know all kinds of people who are in the church, but they're not in Christ. And do you know what you never see? The fruit of the Spirit. If the fruit of the Spirit is not, then the Spirit is not. If the Spirit is present, then the fruit, meaning the visible manifestation of that Spirit of God in your life, is going to be present. I've said it before, I'll say it again. No tree has to work toward producing fruit. As long as that tree is healthy, fruit is going to appear season after season after season. All you have to do is keep the fruit healthy. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. So let me tell you what my Father's will is. My Father's will is that you bear much fruit. How do you do that? You stay grafted into the vine. Oh, hallelujah. You hold tight to the vine. You let the life of God's Spirit flow from the life of Christ into you. And if you'll do that, if you'll let the Spirit of God flow through you as it flowed through the man Jesus Christ, then the fruit of the Spirit will be. You won't have to work to make it. You don't have to do anything to try to help it. It is what it is. And the fruit of the Spirit is. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Lastly, this afternoon, and I'm closing right now, Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Believer, don't you let anybody come at you and condemn you trying to use our primary text today, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Don't you let somebody come at you and preach at you about how you can't be a child of God because bless God, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Because what's new in you is not what they're able to see. That's right. But I'm going to tell you, if what's inside you hadn't changed, then you better get back to the altar. 
You better get back to a place of repentance. You better get back to a place of prayer. Because you may find that you're in the church, but you're not in Christ. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The inward man is different. It's changed. And all of the attributes of God should be manifesting themselves. You should find yourself wanting and yearning. Doesn't mean you're always going to do it. Paul said, the flesh warreth after the Spirit. So in other words, once, once we come to the Lord, unfortunately we don't come to a place of, you know, dancing through lilies and roses. No, no, no. We, we enter into a warfare because our spiritual and our natural are going to be warring against one another, okay? That's what Paul said. But, because our inward man is changed, you're going to find as a born-again believer that all of a sudden you want to do the right things. And even when you do the wrong things, you know what happens? I don't know about you, but I know about me. I get disappointed in myself. Amen. You ever feel that way? You ever do something stupid, somebody cuts you off in traffic, and you decide to send them a message in sign language? And then you get home and you're feeling bad because you're saying to yourself, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have reacted that way. I shouldn't have behaved like that. Do you know what I'm saying today? Amen. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It is what it is. Hallelujah. Praise.